And uh, for those who are joining us, uh, you have, there are two categories of you. I want to welcome both of you. For those of you who don't live in Lagos, don't live anywhere close, thank you for joining us. For those of you who, because of the rain, you decided to stay, I really, like really. But no, we're happy that you're still connected with us. I know some people are dealing with flood and all of those things. So we're, we're happy to have you. If you're joining us for the first time or you've not been here in a long time, we've been doing a series on the book of Galatians. We're coming towards the end now. Uh, but we're still happy that you joined us, and we hope that this message can be of some uh, benefit to you. Now, I want all of you to help me do something, both you watching here and you and those of you here. Please raise up your right hand. I'm not initiating you to any cult. Stop asking questions, right? Raise up your hand. Look at the right hand. Look at those fingers. What do you see with those fingers? They're not all equal, are they? Life, we are not all equal. Life, are we equal? I mean, look at, look at me, look at Emmanuel. Are we equal? Emmanuel, answer that question. Where are you? Yeah, he has run away. Yeah. Yeah. Eh? It's your wife that is saying that. She will get you fired. Anyway, but when we look at our fingers, we see they are not all equal. And in some ways, God doesn't create us equally. The truth is, God doesn't distribute. We have talents, we have gifts, but God doesn't distribute those talents and gifts, equally. Um, but one of the problems we have is that even though he doesn't distribute those gifts equally, he does give us gifts. And sometimes people, because they are gifted in one thing, they believe that they are going to be gifted in other things. Are we together? I find it hard to hear myself here. So you guys may need to help me. So, they feel they are gifted in one thing, and therefore they then feel that they are gifted in all things. Take, for example, you may be gifted politically and intellectually. So gifted that you can even become the leading politician in your country. Maybe the leading politician in the United Kingdom. Now, the mere fact that, that, that you are gifted in those things doesn't mean you are gifted in everything. Take, for instance, the second female prime minister of the UK, Theresa May, a really intellectually gifted woman, very politically gifted. But in this video that I want to show, she tried her hand on some other things that let's just say she maybe was modestly gifted in. Shall we watch? Let's just say we are not all gifted with dancing skills, right? Now, what is the main problem, though, with her dancing? The main problem with her dancing is what plagues all bad dancers, like some of you here, like most of you here. Because I've seen you trying to dance during worship service. The worst kind of dancers are people trying to dance during Christian services. The problem with the dancing is that she failed to keep in step with the rhythm and the tempo of the music. Bad dancing is always a problem when, is the problem with bad dancing is failing to keep in step with the rhythm and the tempo of the music. The rhythm and the tempo are meant to lead and your, your body is meant to follow that rhythm and tempo. I know you've heard, you've heard of the saying, it takes two to what? Now tango is a form, is another form of dance. And in tango, not only should you keep in step with the rhythm and the tempo? You, the lady, usually most forms of tango, the lady has to keep in step with the man. The man leads and then the lady follows. Are you, are you following me? If she fails to keep in step with the leader, if she fails to keep in step with the tempo, all of a sudden the whole dance will not work. Paul in 5 verse 16 says, If truly we live by the Spirit... Let us do what? Keep in step with the Spirit. In other words, the sum total of our Christian life is like one big happy dance. But 
It will not work if we fail to keep in step with the leader of that Christian life, which is the Holy Spirit. Are you getting me? You know, many people who have been Christians for a while and look at the book of Galatians often think, well, this is the book that just tells me that I'm saved by faith and not by works. Well, it tells you that, but it tells you a whole lot more than that. In fact, the book of Galatians tells you a lot about the Holy Spirit as we've seen. So think about this. It tells us in 3 verse 14 that those who are children of Abraham receive the promise that God made to Abraham, which is being saved by faith, and therefore they receive the Holy Spirit. Now, in the receiving of that Holy Spirit, 3 verse 3 tells us that you start your new life by the Holy Spirit giving you new life. But then 5 verse 5 says that that life is going to be ended also through the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, what happens in between? Well, those people that are given the Holy Spirit are the children of God. And like children of their fathers or the children of their mothers, what are you meant to do? You are meant to imitate them. And so that's why in Galatians 5, 22 to 23, we have the fruit of the Spirit, a life uh, characteristics that embody the life that we are truly God's children. Are you following me? Now the question then becomes, how do we then grow in this life that the Holy Spirit starts for us? Well, we grow just like we grow in tango. If you want to grow in tango, you would usually sign up to a school of tango where you learn the rudiments of tango, but more importantly, you are able to practice dancing tango. And that is how you get better. Well, it's the same thing with the Holy Spirit. How do we learn and how do we grow in this life? Well, we go to the school of the Holy Spirit. Where can you find that school? It's the Church of the Living God. The community that the Holy Spirit himself creates. Notice that in verse 26 of chapter 5 and in verse 2 of chapter 6, it uses the word each other. Because he's not speaking to just one person, he's speaking to people as they relate with themselves. Don't forget that the book of Galatians had at the back, at, under the background false teachers. And what is the effect, the eventual effect of false teaching? It brings division and the destruction of the community. City Church, why is that important? As many of us look at our city and our society and our nation, we say, well, the society is broken. In fact, you get overwhelmed by many of the problems you see, and you are led to one fact. Only God can change this nation. Amen. But how is God going to do it? How does God do things on earth? Well, God manifests himself on earth in the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit has decided to dwell in the church. In other words, if God is going to bring a change in our society, he's going to do it through the church, but he must first start in the church. In other words, what he does in here, we are looking for him to do out there. But he first starts in here. So I don't know if you've joined here, you've come today, or you've logged on, and you are the kind of person that is giving up on Nigeria, giving up on Lagos. Can I challenge you to not just join those who continue to complain, but actually see yourself as part of the solution? But if you want to see yourself as part of God's solution, you cannot see that as an individual. You must see it as being part and a member of the community of God. Amen. Maybe you are on your last legs thinking about, well, I don't know what God is going to do here. Me, I'm just looking for my own way of escape. I want to pray and I want to hope that at the end of this sermon, you will not only just be inspired to join the community of God's people, but you will be inspired to build, you'll be inspired to serve, you'll be inspired to be transformed within the kind of community that God can use to make a difference in this place. Amen. Well, I can't think of a better time to ask for God's Spirit since we're going to be talking about the work of God's Spirit. So let us um, pray. Lord, we need you right now, Holy Spirit. We want to speak about the things that you are doing. We believe that you continue to work in our time and in our day. And so we need to see you. We need to see a move of the Spirit in our churches. We need to see a move of the Spirit in our city, in our nation. But we ask, O oh God, that you move among us this morning. Move among us, O oh God, in this sermon. Captivate my lips. Captivate our hearts to hear your word. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Now, today's sermon I've titled, Love Carries Burdens, and we'll treat it under these three headings. The burden of conceit, the burden of each other, and the burden of God. Burden of conceit, the burden of each other, and the burden of God. So let's start, the burden of conceit. Now, before Paul tells us how we are to grow as people who keep in step with the Spirit, in verse 26, he tells us how not to do it. How don't we do it? He said, let us not become conceited. What does, being, what does being conceited mean? Well, the word conceited, the Greek word that's translated as conceited is kinodoxoi. Kinodoxoi. It's made up of two words, kino and doxoi. Doxoi comes from doxa, where we get doxology, which really means glory or praise. Glory or praise. Then the other word is kino. Kino comes from kinos. Kinos means empty or vain. Praise, glory on the one hand, empty or vain. That's why the King James says, let us not be desirous of vain glory. What does it mean to be conceited? It is the attitude of those who believe they have a right to praise when in fact they have no such right. Do you know anybody like that? Well, maybe I can explain because I'm sure some of you will say, yeah, I know somebody like that, and the wife is looking to the husband and right. But maybe I can explain to help you to see whether or not you are someone like that, or maybe you can think of someone like that. It starts with not aiming to climb all mountains. Now, don't get me wrong. Now, climbing a mountain, if some of you have done it like I have, I did it once in my life, I'll never do it again. I realized why Africans don't do it. When I went up, I only saw Oimbo people, straight, none. I was the only, well, me and my friend were the only Africans that were there. You never will do it again. However, when you climb a mountain, it is a feat. It's a, it's a wonderful, you have a wonderful sense of accomplishment. Anybody climb a mountain here? Ah, yeah, uh, Sarah, we're not surprised. Don't worry. We're not surprised. Only Maroc is not, is not a mountain. It's not a mountain. I'm not talking about those that, of you that go to pray on the mountain. I didn't ask a mountain, I asked for a mountain. Now, even though. You shouldn't aim to climb all mountains. What do I mean by that? Okay, it starts with um, two uh, psychologists, right, came up with a study. They wanted to study the effect of um, gaining more knowledge on human confidence. When we gain more knowledge, what does this do to our confidence, uh, right? So it, it was based on a, a landmark study that's now referred popularly to, uh, is popularly known as the Dunning-Kruger effect. The Dunning-Kruger effect, all right? So let me explain. Let's put all on the board. So you see confidence on this side, and then you see knowledge on this side. The, the larger you go, uh, the more you go up, that means great, you gain in confidence. As you go right, that means you gain in knowledge. So what happens, we usually start, so here's what the graph looks like, but we usually start with no idea about a thing. We, get, we start with no idea about a thing. All of a sudden, somebody sends you a Facebook message. Or maybe you listen to a TED Talk. Or maybe you go and listen to one sermon, and now it's like, hey, I know everything. Now, when you get to that summit, it's called Mount Stupid. Don't try and rise to Mount Stupid. What is Mount Stupid? Mount Stupid is where arrogance meets with ignorance. You see, very little knowledge. But then the person goes all the way like, ah, they are the, are the people that... They have learned one small thing. They are telling every single person, do you know this? You don't know this. You are very useless. You know, you know, they are always giving you. And then they start to accord accolades to themselves. It's like one famous person in Nigeria. I think he may be a politician. He, you know, he calls himself a historian. I'm a historian. Because he likes to read a little bit of history. Or one other guy that I know, he likes to call himself a Bible scholar. Because he's learned a little bit about manuscripts and he's visited Jerusalem. Actually, there are two of them. Now, if you actually look at the, his self-claimed historian and what he says, his history is really muddled up, he's really biased, and no real historian will give him any credit. Uh, no credible historian will actually say this is real history. And the other two guys who are Bible scholars, they keep peddling heresies up and down the place. You know what Paul says in 6 verse 3 about people that are conceited? He says they deceive themselves because they think they are something while they are what? They are not. You see, this conceit is devastating 
for the community. Why? Because it brings about a competitive mindset. In verse 4, it talks about we comparing ourselves with each other. We enter into a competition. And this competitive game, where we seek glory for ourselves, it normally leads to two sets of people because conceit manifests itself in two different ways. Leads to two sets of people because conceit manifests itself in two different ways. How are the two ways it manifests itself? He said, let us not be conceited, provoking one, and envying two, one another, or each other. The provo provoking leads to being in the group that we can call the superiors. And the envying is the group that we can call the inferiors. So let's take the, the superiors. The word provoking um, has a sense in it where people challenge um, um, uh, you to a contest, right? It's a competitive word where we challenge people to a contest. For instance, you know, people that normally will say, ah, meanwhile, let's say, you, I don't know where you live. They'll say, ah, come, let's go and play table tennis. The guy that said, let's go and play table tennis, is because he can keep beating me. Well, do you understand? <laughs> so usually you challenge people to a contest when you know you are good in it or you believe you are good in it. For instance, last Sunday, I challenged all the City brothers to a football match coming this Saturday. Why do you think I did that? <laughs> it's because I know that none of you are as good as me. <laughs> but we shall see on Saturday. Do you understand? Now, when that works in people in church, that usually, it always manifests itself from people who believe they are morally superior and maybe that they have spiritual gifts above other people or maybe that they give above other people. They always carry themselves as superior. The inferior are motivated by envy. What does envy want? Envy wants what others have or it doesn't want others to have what it lacks. And so as a result, people that are driven by envy, you know the problem that they have? They often are very aware about what they don't have. They often have a low view about themselves. While the superiors feel morally and um, uh, spiritually above others, the inferior feel morally ashamed and inadequately gifted. You think you fall in any of those categories? Sometimes we actually overlap. We fall here, there, we fall here. Let me help us with three different uh, things to check out, right? We want to look at people who are, uh, when, uh, arguments, when you're critiqued, and celebrating others' achievements. Now, the superior person, they tend to pick arguments with most people without ever ending them. The, the argument doesn't end. It's like, okay, when is this thing going to end? No, but when you said this other one, you know when, it, uh, this was the first thing we argued about, number one. But then one has A, B, and C. Then you get into A, and then it's one another. You start arguing, you don't even know what was the thing we started arguing about in the first place. They always look for confrontation or create conflict. Whereas the inferiors, they never want to argue about anything, even when they actually have real disagreements. What do they do? They always avoid conflict. What about when you are critiqued? Well, the superior gets very angry when they are critiqued. And when you are giving them the critique, they are not thinking about the critique. They are thinking about the person that is actually, you know, like giving them the critique. I remember the first time Dami wanted to critique me. That's when I knew this guy cannot stay in this church for long. <laughs> He's no longer in the staff. Because I was just wondering, you know, he just wanted to give me some, he said he wanted to just give me some feedback. <laughs> Pastor, just some feedback. Hey, Dami. <laughs> But you're, you're tall now. You have started preaching. <laughs> you understand? Vamos sent him away. But you can come back. You can come back if you are humble. <laughs> but they get angry. They are very immediately, they don't listen to what is being said. And immediately they are giving an attack. They are attacking the person, not necessarily what the person said, but they keep attacking the person. Whereas with the inferior, what happens? When they are critiqued, they get so discouraged. And they become very defensive, even though they don't voice it out. They're just defensive in their mind. On another hand, what they do is that they may have legitimate uh, pushback against the critique, but they will never say it. They just give in too easily. Finally, how about celebrating? Both of them behave the same way. When it's about some, or this, someone else's achievement, the superiors don't celebrate others' achievement. 
Why? Because they believe that they could have done it better themselves if they were given the chance. On the other hand, the inferior will not celebrate other people's achievement. Why? Because they remember how they have not achieved the same thing. In other words, they are playing the same game. In other things, in fact, they both dehumanize people. How? The superior dehumanizes people by looking down on them, whilst the inferior dehumanizes people by looking up at them. The superior silences others by dominating conversation, while the inferior silences others by withdrawing and not participating in the conversation. Do you understand? They are playing the same game, using the same framework, and while it ends up in different results for them, it always ends up in the, devast the same devastating result for the community. What is that? It divides the community and ends up destroying the community. And if we are like that, if the church is like that, then we will not fulfill the calling that God has given us beyond the church world. Why? Because then the church will not just become a mirror of the division that is in our society, but it will become an instrument for further perpetuating that division in the society. This is why we have to keep in step with the Spirit. This is why we cannot allow conceit and the conceited behavior to grow in the church. The end result is that we cannot be the salt and light that God has called us to be. Amen? And so what do we need? Well, we need to keep in step with the Spirit if indeed we live by the Spirit. And that takes me to my second point. The burden of each other. So how do we become a spirit-led community, well, we have to have people who are more and more spirit-led, people who live by the spirit. And Paul tells us how we start that. He says in verse 4, each one should test their own actions. Now, when you test your own actions, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 17, verse 3, that God tests the heart. He tests the heart. God knows us more than we know ourselves. But if you want to know yourself, start by testing your action. Don't compare yourself with other people. Compare yourself with who? Yourself. When you test your actions, you compare yourself with yourself. So it is about developing self-knowledge. How well do you know yourself? How well do you know yourself? Well, let me tell you about how we know ourselves. It's the same way we come to know anything. Let's go back to Donning Kruger. Right? So, if you get, if you are lucky, now most people, not most people, but a lot of people actually never, they love the mountain top and they stay there, sadly. Right? And they continue to perpetrate conspiracy theories and stuff like that. But if you are lucky, you will start to, as you increase in knowledge, what happens is you realize, ah, this thing, there's more to it. Oh. And if you go further and know that you even start getting more in despair, you get to the value of despair where you be like, I will never know this thing because now I'm getting so much information. I thought I knew this thing, but it's actually more so complicated. I will never know it. But if you stay long enough, you start the beginning of enlightenment. What happens? You start to say, ah, I think it makes sense. You go longer enough. What happens? Ah, increase enlightenment. It's complicated, but now I, I, I start to see more. I am still learning. And when you get to the guru status, what is there? I finally come to all knowledge. No. There's always something to learn. Now, notice people that are at an expert and guru status know. Look at how far they are. They know and also they are confident. Look at how high up they are. But they are always learning. What does that tell me? It tells me that they don't suffer from low self-esteem like the inferiors. Why? They know what they know and they are confident about it. But they are not arrogant like the superiors. Why? Because they always want to learn. People that almost feel like they can't learn anything, not because they say, I can't learn anything. Everybody says, oh, we can always learn. No, but you see the way they don't listen to feedback. They don't even know people that know better than them on a subject. They are not humble. You see, what is happening here is that this person has learned humility. Why? Because this journey is a journey of humility. They went to the valley first before they got to the top. And that is why people who are experts at something, they don't think less about themselves. They don't think too much about themselves. They just think about themselves what? Less. So when Paul says, test your actions, there's a journey to having knowledge. There's a journey to 
self-knowledge. He's saying, test your actions. Life becomes a lifestyle. Those who are led by the Spirit becomes a lifestyle of testing our actions and improving upon them. Compare yourself with yourself. What does that mean? That sounds high, high for looting. Well, here are two ways you can do it. Compare yourself with your past self and compare yourself with your future self. When you compare yourself with your past self, what, do you, what are you doing? You are looking at who you used to be and say, am I even improving or am I actually regressing? You are thinking about what people used to say about you. I had trouble tr sleeping last night. And so my mind was just wondering. I started thinking about stuff I'd done to people 14 years ago, 15 years ago. I was like, man, I was a horrible person. Man, I was a horrible person. How, how could you do such a thing? But the question is, well, I'm not doing that kind of thing again. Ah, maybe I am improving. So you have to compare yourself with who you were before, but also compare yourself with who you think God is going to make you. And that's where verse 5 comes in, which is a little bit technically difficult. But let's read it with the beginning part of verse 4. You know verse 5 where it says each one should carry their own load. But if you take the beginning part of verse 4 where it says each one should test their own actions for each one should carry their own load. The word load there is, is like the word, is like a backpack, right? So you are able to carry your own load. And when we carry backpacks, we are carrying our own load, right? What is the load? We are carrying that load, the load where we've tested our actions, the sum total of our life's behaviors. And it, the Greek construction of verse 5, is, it has a future tense to it, meaning we are carrying our load to somewhere in the future. And most commentators know exactly what they say. That place in the future is that we are carrying into the judgment day to present before the Lord. Each one should test their own actions and see what at the end of the day God is going to say about us. Now, if we know that we are trying to be, God is making us to be conformed to the image of Christ, the question is how are you on that journey? Compare yourself with where you are today with where you are going. Are we together? And maybe when you do so, you can see in a paraphrased version of this saying that John Newton is famous for. John Newton who penned the words of Amazing Grace. He said this, and I'm paraphrasing. I must confess I am not what I should be. I am not what I want to be. I am not what I would be. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. I am not what I used to be. Can you say that? If God is working in you and you are living life in self-discovery, being led by the Spirit, kept in step with the Spirit, then if you are improving, then you can start to take pride, legitimate pride in yourself, not arrogant pride, but legitimate pride that I am partnering with God in making me a better person. I'm partnering with God and I'm seeing self-improvement. If you are improving based on the knowledge that you have of yourself, testing your own actions, and you are growing in humility, then you are being set up for God using you for a great, great thing. And you know what that is? Verse 2, to become a burden bearer to become a burden bearer. Turn to your neighbor and say, may you become a burden bearer. Turn to the next neighbor and say, may you become my burden bearer. They will say it, they will say it. <laughs> but you know, Paul says, when we carry one another's burdens, we fulfill the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? Well, the law of Christ, let me tell you what it's not. It's not the law of Moses. Neither is it Christ fulfilling the law of Moses. No. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 20 to 21, it makes a distinction between the law of Christ and the law of Moses. It says that you have this thing called God's law. But when there was a time of the Old Testament and the Old Covenant, when it was in force, God's law was what? The law of Moses. But now that you are in, the New Testament, a New Covenant is in force, God's law is now what? The law of Christ. So what is the law of Christ that we fulfill when we carry one another's burdens? Well, the law of Christ is basically the ethical demands of the gospel. If you believe the gospel, if you say you are a follower of Jesus Christ, guess what? Even though you are saved by faith, we have do's and what? Do's. We don't live our lives just anyhow. Paul says that even though I'm not under the law of Moses, I am not without God's law. 
I am under the law of Christ. There are do's and don'ts. What are they? Very simply, the examples, the uh, commandments, and the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ and his disciples as found in the New Testament explicitly and in the Old Testament implicitly. Should I say what it is again? It is the commandments, the, teach, the example, the commandments, and the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ and his disciples as found the experience in the New Testament and then implicitly in the Old Testament. And he's basically saying, Jesus has told us about how we ought to live our lives. But actually, when you guys gather together and you carry one another's burdens, you are showing, demonstrating that you are somebody who is fulfilling the ethical demands of what it means to follow Jesus. You are living in light of what Jesus wants you to do. So maybe there is an example. It's still sounding so theoretical. So supposed, supposing that somebody is caught in a sin. Paul gives this example in verse 1. Supposing you are caught in a sin. Now when he says caught in a sin, it's not that stainless caught Lola in a sin. It's implicit. But it's not so much that stainless caught Lola, but that Lola was caught by the sin. That is, another translation says, overtaken, overwhelmed by what? The sin. So supposing somebody is plagued down by the sin. The person is in a very precarious situation. Maybe a sin of addiction to something. Maybe pornography or, I don't know, some kind of drugs. I, before I, when I started preaching, I said, oh, drugs were the stuff for the 80s and 90s. Apparently, it's very much for the 2010s, uh, 2020s, right? So, so I don't know if any of us may be going through that kind of thing. So if somebody is caught in a serious sin, how do we react in church? Well, Here's how the superior wants to react. <laughs> because the superior is zealous for the house of God to remain pure. The superior is zealous for us to live a certain life. So the superior is, ah, where's the person? Let me quickly go and meet them. The superior says, I want to restore them back to the life that God has called them to do. Whereas the inferior is, like, ah, hey, we're all sinners. Oh, hey, I don't even know. Even me, I'm still trying to manage myself. So let's do it gently, gently. Let's be softly, softly. You see, the superior is zealous for restoration, but that leads to harsh confrontation, whereas the inferior is jealous, is zealous for gentleness, but that will lead to no confrontation. But the person who is led by the Spirit, in verse 2 says, when you carry one, when you restore the person, restore the person what? Gently. Restore the person gently. Because the person who lives by the Spirit, when he sees that person that is caught in a sin, he doesn't see that person as a competitor, as a conceited person does, because he's playing the competition game. He sees the person, notice how Paul starts verse 1, brothers and sisters. He sees the person as part of the family, you're my blood. Not as a statistic, not in a dehumanized way. So that's the first thing. The second thing is because this person is spirit-led, because this person lives by the Spirit, the person believes in the Spirit's power to restore somebody from sin. They've experienced it in their own life. And so they are not going to leave you where you are. They are coming to say, how can we restore you? But one more thing, Paul hints at that also in verse 2, where he says that, but test yourself or else, I'm sorry, watch yourself or else you will be tempted. That person is also aware of their own tendencies to be what? Tempted. And so when they are going to restore, they'll say, if not for God, oh, ah, this is where I won't be, even be standing. So they don't go in a harsh way. They don't go feeling arrogant and superior. They go, how? Gentle. Because don't forget, as Toki showed us, the fruit of the Spirit which is love, also manifests itself in what? Gentleness. Oh, I don't know if there's somebody here today. Maybe you have been overtaken by the sin of masturbation. Maybe the sin of some addiction. Maybe it's pornography. Maybe it's gambling. Maybe it is lying. Maybe it is anger. Maybe it's manipulation. Can I tell you here that we are not here to judge you, but don't remain in that sin. God has brought us here to carry that burden for you. If you carry that burden, the word burden there is a heavy weight. It was never meant to be carried alone. But when two people help you carry it, or three people help you carry it, all of a sudden the burden becomes what? Lighter. Don't remain in your sin. Stop being scared. Maybe you've suffered church hurt before. But if we are truly a gospel-centered church, I can tell you, confess that sin and let us help you carry it together. 
How we do that? We will, we will tell you about our own story. Look, this is who I was. <laughs> Your own is not too bad. But God help me. We will counsel you. This is what you should be doing. We will pray with you. This is how God, we want you to help this person. We will keep you accountable. The one thing we will not do is to allow you to carry that burden alone. Because God has called us to be in family. And when we are the spirit-led, humble people, knowing ourselves, when we become that kind of, when we become that kind of family, we start to bear one another's burdens. But you know, this doesn't also work just for sins alone. It's much more broadly applied. But let me be out of straight with it now. In Hebrews 10, verse 24, right, it tells us that. You, you see, what's happening in Galatians 5 is, remember, we said it's a competitive spirit, right? It's a competitive spirit, right? That's why they're provoking themselves in this competition. Now, that is based on a win-loss, a win-lose a, 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 a competition mindset. But Hebrews 10 verse 24 tells us that there's another kind of competition mindset. Don't put it up yet. I'll, let, let, I'll explain. There's another kind of competition mindset. Maybe I can explain what I mean by win-loss and win-win. You know, the, the Euros are going on now. It's a football tournament for those who watch football, right? Now, in most sports, right, in most sports competitions, if I win, Yemi will lose. Do you understand? And he will lose. <laughs> the Euros are going. If somebody wins the tournament, it means that all the other participants, what happened to them? They can't all both win. And that's the Galatians chapter 5 and 6. And that breeds all manner of things, divisions and whatever. You cannot bring that same thing into the church. But what does a win-win look like? Now, uh, maybe I can illustrate this way. I'll just modify a story that I used to know. Uh, Solomon, Solomon, I don't know if he's watching, right? Solomon is a respectful member, a respected member of this church community. Sasolo, right? He's a respect. Now, he hails from um, a place in the east called Imbisi. Now, he's a really, I'm, I'm not misquoting him. Now, he's a really active member. Now, you know, he's made, he's made some, some good of himself in Lagos, but occasionally he goes back to the community. Now, supposing that Solomon wanted to create a small bridge for the community, and you put, the, uh, you know, giving by Solomon, you know, how that thing is. He went to do that, but he needed a contractor. There were no people in Nimbus to build it. So he called from three other places in the east. He called the contractor from Oweri, he called the contractor from Oka, and he called the contractor from Niwi. So they now came, and they started to bid. So the guy that first came, the Oweri guy came, and he said, how much is it going to be? He said, ah, now nah, it's going to be 30,000 naira. I said, 30,000, how? Break it down. He said, ah, 10,000 is for material, 10,000 for logistics, and 10,000 is for my neighbor. So oh, okay, all right, let's see that. So then the Oka guy comes. Oka, right? Yeah, he said, ah, Oka, this thing is 60,000. No? What do you mean by 60,000? How can you say? He said, ah, you know, we Oka people are not bright people. We, <laughs> we believe in quality. Yeah, yeah, so I'm using quality things for you 20,000 for material, 20,000 for uh, uh, logistics, and 20,000 for what? For labor. I want you know, it's in a bit of it's true. Okay, people, they have quality, so he's really thinking. But the Navy guy now steps forward. Okay, how much are you going to do it? Navy guy says 90,000. Eh? He's like, what? What are you talking about? Are you trying to shaft me? Are you trying to? Because you know, people are enterprises. Are you trying to? I know that. You know, I said, ah, the Navy man says, cool down. Okay, cool down. He said, 30,000 is for you. <laughs> he said, 30,000 is for me. And the remaining 10,000 will now tell the Oweri man to come and do this. In other words, the Oweri man, the Oweri man wins, the Nehwi man wins, and the contractor also what? Wins. It's win win. Oka man, nobody cares about Oka people. All right? It's a win win thing. In other words, that's what the writer of Hebrews 10 is saying. He's saying we can provoke one another in a way. We can be in some kind of competition, but it doesn't mean that if I win, you lose. We can provoke one another to love and to good deeds. We all win. We we'll win so much, we we'll get tired of winning. <laughs> Somebody, as one U.S. president said, who will leave the nameless, uh, the name, the, the nameless shall remain nameless. But we provoke one another unto what? Love and good deeds. 
It's a sort of competition, but it's a competition that is born out of the Holy Spirit's energy. And so it is bringing love. It is multiplying love. And we are carrying one another's burdens. But notice what he says in verse 25, following after. He says that, yes, not giving up a meeting one with one another. And can I just say, <laughs> you can't carry the burden of the people you don't see and therefore you don't know. You can't carry the burden of people you don't see and therefore you don't know. And I want to challenge us that this, we can't, and I, I want to say very lightly to, thank you for all those who are tuning in digitally and I can understand if there are difficulties and we can, we've started meeting all those things. But can I say that <laughs> digitally connecting and physically attending are not the same thing. I can see faces here. I can see Fage. I can see DJ. I can see Sarah. And after that, I can go and tell the, ask them, how are they doing? And then they can be telling me about what they're doing. And then next week, I can try to find out what's up. Or I can then say, hey, how about we meet to lunch? Oh, this is what you're going through. Then the person becomes comfortable to share what they're going through. And when they share what they're going through, I know that I can now encourage them. He says, when you meet one, with one another, you, you do what? You encourage what? One another. And that is various types of encouragement happening in the house of God. Whether it is mental issues, I cannot tell you about the, the many testimonies we've had of people struggling with mental health issues. I'm not saying that they've been completely delivered, but what I'm saying is that they have seen improvement because people were there to serve them. People were there, to, were there to, for them, to, to provide shoulders for them to cry on. There are people that are there to cook for them. There are people that are there to encourage them. And so they get better with it because they saw one another. Even if it is vocational and financial, one of the wonderful things I like seeing in church is when somebody is helping somebody. I've seen people pray for people and their situation have changed. People have given people advice. People have even invested in people. People are being employed. People are being mentored. People are getting financial aid. People are even getting financial investment. Why? Because we are called to carry one another's burden. As we see the day where we will carry our backpack and give to the Lord, as we see that day approaching, there is a competitive spirit within the family of God that does not mean that one person wins and the other person loses, but that we all win because we are being provoked unto love and good deeds. Are we going to be that kind of people? So maybe I can challenge us for another kind of burden I want us to carry. It is the burden of serving church central operations. Amen? Yeah. Is that Pelumi that said that? <laughs> you know, last week we said some stuff about, uh, two last week, we want you guys to serve. That is, whether it is during this worship service, and when I say worship service, you know it's not just the people that are inside here. We need people doing many things. Or whether it's midweek stuff, we need people leading, we need people leading. And maybe again, some of us, you know, we have certain excuses, and blah, blah, and all of those things, but the excuses at some point have to give way for the love of the Spirit. And so I want to challenge you, if you've been coming to this church, not, you know, fairly regularly, not for, the, let me see, three months, two, <laughs> and a half. <laughs> challenge yourself. Test your actions. And I want you to not just serve, but I want you to serve in five ways. Five ways. It must be sacrificial. You, I want you to serve sacrificially. I want you to serve diligently. I want you to serve excellently. I want you to serve dedicatedly. I want you to serve joyfully. Sacrificially, it should cost you. It's not that, ah, it may cost you. No, it will cost you. And that's what's good about it. I want you to serve diligently. Put in the right effort. I want you to serve excellently. Make it so good. Put your best into it. I want you to also serve dedicatedly. That is, have the right attitude. Come on time. When you are called to serve, come on time. Which means, don't, don't come when service is starting. Come when you are meant to pray. And if you can't come on time, send a message. And then you'll say, I'm running late. And then serve joyfully. For God loves a cheerful word. Giver. Don't say, ah, this thing is costing me so much. It's costing me so much. Yes, it's costing me so much. And it is helping my brother so much. Because God has called us to serve, to carry one another's burdens. Don't get me wrong. Other ways we do that, we give. That is really important. Please don't slack in that. Keep giving and even keep increasing your giving. We attend. That is also really important. 
but we also need you to serve so that you can fulfill the law of what? Christ. I hope we can be that kind of community because these are the kinds of communities that change cities and nations. Communities where people are burdened and carry one another's burdens. If we get trained in carrying one another's burdens, we will not be the kind of people that go on Twitter using a VPN, go on Facebook, <laughs> doing all those things, ranting about the world, the government and all of these things. No, because you've been trained in the house of the Lord to carry one another's burdens, the house of the Lord centrally will carry society's burdens as much as they can, but you as an individual will also be used to carrying society's burdens. You will not be a complainer, but you see yourself as a solution maker. May God make us those kinds of people. Amen. Amen. But now finally I have to run to the end. The last point is the burden of God. The burden of God. Because some people are saying something like this. Whoa. My own burden here in this life is too heavy. And as one um, um, one of our most eminent um, thinkers and philosophers said I can't go and come and add on top of an, my own burden and kill myself. Do you understand? So I can't. And if person who said, did you not say in Galatians chapter 5, it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. In other words, you are telling me that I'm meant to flex. So I don't want to kill myself. Allow me to what? I do say, just flex. Don't put O there. Don't put O. We are only quoting Bible here. So you need to give me a more foundational reason why I should carry somebody else's burden. Now here's the point. I agree with you. 5 verse 1, and even this 6 verse 2 that we've spoken about, they say that there is a way you carry burdens that actually will not make you free. But I want to insist and make it very clear to you that the argument that we are making here, that Paul is making is this. If you are not carrying other people's burdens, it is proof that you are not free. If you are not carrying people's burdens, it is it's not that you are not carrying people's burdens so, you don't, so that you don't become free. It is proof that you are not free. Why? Because if you are not carrying other people's burdens, you are only concerned about a life where you are carrying your own burden alone and maybe your family's burdens, right? You are just demonstrating that you are truly in slavery. Why? Because you will find out that life is very, very hard. You know why? Because it is. <laughs> and it is even harder than you actually think. What do I mean? Um, someone sent me an Instagram video this uh, a few days ago. I think, I think it was my sister-in-law. So. so I watched the Instagram video, right? And then it was like IGTV. So you know what happens? Like it comes to the end, then another one comes. So I was trying to go to the adventure. And I said, ah, I saw Shane Kuti. Ah, I said, okay. Let me see. He was going to. Do, he had done an IGTV live. I said, I said, okay. Let me see what he's saying. What for something means. So I sort of, you know, how you do that thing. Enter three minutes, go to ten minutes. Uh, so I got to a particular point, and he said something very actually interesting. He said, not only does he not believe in God, but he cannot believe that any God can come and judge him. He said, God will be sitting down in heaven, and then that God decided. To put me in this earth, not just put me anywhere in this earth, he put me in this Nigeria. <laughs> With all the people that are trying to pull me down, all the people that are you know, saying terrible things about me. And then I am trying my best to navigate through all of this thing. And then that God will come and judge me. Some of you are laughing. You have thought that same thing. Like, God, why did you bomb me here? You just didn't say you know, what you eventually said. You see what he's saying? He's saying that for him, sin is a natural result of trying to navigate a life in this world, a life where we have so many burdens. And how can therefore God judge us when we have so many burdens? Now, Sean is right partly. He's partly right. Life is really, really hard. Can I say it again? I wish I had that, uh, you know, that mean where just is at this point someone just says, Aye leo, aye male, you know, life is hard in case you don't know. But he's wrong in some ways. First of all, God did not create a life, a world where sin was. That was our own doing. 
But second, you and I know, and I've given this illustration a number of times. If you saw, if you found out that a person, a guy who was born in an impoverished home, in an impoverished neighborhood, the father left, he was brought up by the mom alone, but she could, she couldn't, she wasn't there, so she neglected him. He was raised by the gangs, got into drugs, eventually committed a terrible murder. If you found out that he was convicted at the court, let me tell you what all of us will say. You will say the verdict was right, even though you understand the circumstances that created that situation. And so where Sheon is also wrong is this. God still has the right to judge us because the circumstances that produce our crime or our sin does not absolve us of the responsibility of being held for that crime and sin. Are we together? And this is where I am saying that you don't know how much your burden is. Because this, we are very aware of the daily burdens that we go through. Our mental issues, the difficulty of trying to find jobs or trying to get better jobs. All the problems that, that we have in our families and all of those things. We are very aware of that. But listen, if you have not surrendered your life to the Lord, let me tell you that you are carrying a bigger burden than you can ever know. Because God is, has the right to judge us, you are carrying the burden of the consequences of your sins. Oh, and that is such a heavy burden. Because you see, with our daily burdens, what we want is for those burdens to be made lighter. But you see, this, this other burden, it is not one that can be made lighter. Nobody can help you make it lighter. No, this is a burden that you need to be completely lifted off your shoulders. It is a heavy burden. Maybe you may seek help, <laughs> but I can tell you, your mother cannot help you. Your father cannot help you. Happy Father's Day. Your siblings cannot help you. Oh, your entire family, maybe if they collectively came together, they can't help you. It is too big. It is too big for their shoulders. Oh, maybe I can call my society to help me. Too big for their shoulders. Maybe I can call my city to help me. Too big for their shoulders. Maybe my entire nation can help me. Too big for their shoulders. Let me even help you. If you take all the human beings that have ever existed all around the world and put their collective shoulders together, it is not broad enough to carry the burden of the consequence of your sin. You need somebody else to carry that burden for you. Where can we find such a person? Oh, I prayed last night and I prayed for people. I prayed for Shem Kuti. I said, God, let him meet the burden-bearing God of Psalm 68, verse 19 to 20. And even if you can't reach him, I can say if they are joined here today, God can meet you. Oh, that's, what does he say? He says, praise be to the Lord. Why is he praising God? Why is he praising God? Because this God is God our Savior. Daily makes our, 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 our daily burdens what? Lighter. Why? By burning. But he does something much more profound. This God actually saves. He saves. He saves. He saves. He says that from the sovereign Lord comes what? The escape of death. That is the final consequence of all our sins. God is here to save you. Listen, you are carrying more than you know. Your unrest, the unrest that you feel is because your life's heading towards bearing an eternal burden in hell. But I have good news for you. God can carry your burdens. I have good news for you. God wants to carry your burdens. I have further good news for you. God will carry your burdens if only you surrender it to him. You see, how can we do that? God became a human being the person of Jesus and he said because these people are so without rest I have come to give them rest so he says let all who are weary and are heavy burdened come to me and I will give them what rest because when Jesus went to the cross he exchanged our unrest to give us his rest Jesus went to the cross to bear the burdens of our sin you say to me but I thought that it's just one person now how can he bear my sins I thought the weight of the sins of the world was so much but listen his shoulders are broad enough because his love is big enough if only you will put those burdens on Jesus' body you will see that he can give you rest but he deals with the consequences of our sin, that biggest burden with his physical body. 
how does he deal with the daily burdens of our sin? He also deals with it with his body. You see, that Jesus did not just remain dead. Jesus rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven. He sent the Holy Spirit to come. And the Holy Spirit started the church. Do you know what the church is called? The body of Christ. And so Jesus in his resurrected state daily bears our burdens. How? By giving us a new family. A family where we have brothers and sisters that can daily carry our benefits. That's why he says, learn of me. Those who Jesus has said, he says, learn of me. Be humble like me. I am humble in heart. Take upon you my yoke. That is the yoke to bear one another's burdens. And then he says, my burden is light. How is it light? Listen. Praying for people constantly. People that keep sinning and coming back over and over again. Counseling people. If you've done a little bit of it, you know that that burden is quite heavy. But if you look only at the sins, or if you look only at the problems, you'll see that it's heavy. But if you look at the burdens that Jesus carried for you on the cross, you will see that in comparison to that burden, it is what? Light. If you want to carry one another's burdens, if you want to consistently do it, stop looking at the people. Stop looking at the sin. Do what? Look to Jesus. If we become a gospel-centered community led by the Spirit, where we are all burden bearers, I am not lying. I am not lying. Lagos will never be the same again. If we see that multiplied around this nation, I can guarantee you Nigeria will not be the same again. Do we want to be that kind of people? Then let's rise up and pray.